Hello. Uh, thanks for joining me for session two of Data Foundations for Non-Specialists. Uh, we are obviously doing this session asynchronously, um, and I'll have some exercises for you uh, to work on, and then we'll discuss when we're back in person again next week. So with that, we'll jump into it. Um, this this session is, is uh, going to be some open-ended practice with some real data sets. Uh, and then the discussion part will come next week when we are uh, talking about uh, the solutions um, to that. So um, we'll go ahead and give you an overview of what we plan to do in this session. Um, we're going to go through a general workflow. This is a four-step workflow for analyzing a data set. And this is going to be kind of the basis of what we do with, with every data set that we work with in this series. And it is my hope this is something that you'll be able to take with you uh, beyond this series. Um, we're gonna take a look at uh, data sets. One of them is how does spending on healthcare affect child mortality rates? Another one is called epidemic in a pandemic. And this is about um, opioid overdoses during the, the pandemic and the, especially during the early days of lockdowns. Um, we're going to talk about uh, one of the other options is Florence Nightingale's data set that changed medicine, um, a cure for COVID. This is uh, explicitly looking at the drug trial tests for hydroxychloroquine as a as a treatment um, for COVID or a preventative for COVID. Um, we're another data set is progress eradicating polio. This is looking at polio rates and vac vaccination rates uh, in different countries around the world. And um, last is, are, COVID, are the COVID-19 vaccines working? This is data from uh, uh, Seattle and the Seattle area uh, right after the uh, first COVID vaccines were made widely, widely available. Um, and then next week we'll share and discuss uh, how you analyze these data sets and some communication choices that you made. So that's, this is the overview uh, for what we're working on in this session. So I'm uh, going to talk about this general workflow for data analysis. And step number one is always to define the question that you want to ask. Um, if you're going to go to the data set and ask uh, specific questions, you really want to define what is that question um, very, very specifically and make sure that question is actually testable with the data on hand. So, you know, part of this is, is saying, okay, well, what uh, data am I going to need to answer my, my narrowly defined uh, question? Then the second step in the general workflow is to show the data. Um, and so when, when you have the question, then you want to look at the data that are relevant to that, that question. Um, I also uh, recommend at least the mental exercise of going through, you know, what will the data look like if the hypothesis is supported or the question is, is answered in the affirmative, or what will the data look like if the hypothesis is not supported or the question is answered in the negative and think about that. Um, when you are really learning how to do this and getting comfortable with it, I actually advocate not just doing this as a mental exercise, but physically sketching out what you think these graphs will look like on a, on a piece of paper or a whiteboard or something like that. And I, I've done that and I'll, I'll model that today uh, when we go through the exercise. Um, step number three is evaluate the conclusions and the confidence that you have in in those conclusions. So once once you have defined your question, you're taking a look at the data. Now it's time to say, okay, what is what is my conclusion? Is this is this hypothesis supported or not supported? And how confident am I in that conclusion? Either way, you know, am I very confident the answer is no, or am I very confident the answer is yes? Am I a little bit confident the, that the answer is yes? You know, but largely it's inconclusive. You know, where what is my degree of of confidence um, in that conclusion? And then the final step is to think about what is the best way to communicate the evidence? Um, you know, what is the graph visualization or table or even just statement that I'm going to make um, that, that most clearly communicates the evidence 
that I have and the evidence that I looked at in the data set. I am a strong advocate for data visualizations and graphs. So oftentimes I'm thinking about what, what graph do I want to use to communicate this? And what aesthetic choices can I make to enhance the communication with that graph? And, and I mean things like different color choices, different spacing choices, um, different symbols. Can I add some kind of heading or title um, to aid in the communication? So this is this is what we want to talk about. We're going to do a whole session on on communication, but this is the the sort of final step in the in the workflow of of working with with data. So to kind of go through each of these pieces, you know, individually, um, one is one is define the question. And like I said, this is where you really want to think about which data are needed. Specifically, which variables do I need to answer this question? And if it turns out that you do not have those variables in your data set, then you're going to need to get another question. Not every data set can answer every question that you have. And so you need really need to think about um, which data are needed to answer the specific question you have, which variables in the data set are important. Um, this is also the, the point in the analytical process where you might say, oh, you know, we have, we have data collected, uh, you know, maybe 200 observations on 12 different variables. But for this question I have, maybe only three or four or two of those variables are relevant. This is, this is what you want to go through as you're setting up your analysis, deciding which data are important, which variables are needed to answer your question. And then two is showing the data. You know, this, this is where you're going to actually plot your data, make a graph of your data. But you want to think about, you know, what will my graph look like for my main question? And I, I want you in, in when you're working through this exercise to do actual hand sketches first. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a few examples of this. So um, I conducted an experiment with um, uh, lizards and I did this experiment with my high school students in Chicago uh, when I was teaching, this was back in uh, 2010. Um, and we, our main question was, is, is moisture important to female lizards when they're choosing where to lay their eggs. We were working with, with brown and knoll lizards, uh, which is what I went on to study uh, in, in my PhD at UVA. But the way we, we conducted this experiment, we presented female lizards with five different moisture choices, um, ranging from very dry, 0% moisture to very wet, 75% moisture. And we, we let them you know, choose where they were gonna lay their eggs. Once a week, we checked the uh, potted soil that was at these five different moisture choices. And we, we collected eggs and determined, you know, which choices had they made. And the hypothesis here was that uh, females were going, female lizards were going to prefer the wettest um, moisture substrate available. So they're going to prefer the wet soil over the dry soil. And so I had my students sketch out, you know, what will our data look like if our hypothesis is not supported? And this, this is a student sketch, and I think this one is really good, um, where they have sketched out, uh, you can see there's five different categories on X, and the Y axis is not a second variable, it's just the number of observations in each of those categories. And you can see there's no actual numbers on this graph, that's not important for this exercise. But what is important is that all of those bars are roughly the same height. There's not a clear preference for wetter or drier or anything in between. But this, the, there's, there's not a clear preference. All of those bars are the same height. And the one thing I like about this is how the bars are not drawn exactly equal. There's some amount of variation and you, you know, we're anticipating some variation in this experiment, but there's really no support for the hypothesis that the female lizards were gonna prefer to lay their eggs in the wetter moistures. And so then the second sketch, this is support for the hypothesis where you can see these bars um, getting uh, bigger as we move to the wetter uh, substrate. And I apologize if my face is over the corner of that uh, graph there. Um, 
but you can see a very small bar at 0% moisture, a little bit taller bar at 12.5%, a little bit taller at 25, a little bit taller at 50, and then a very tall bar at 75. These, these bars are not all equal. So the number of eggs laid in these different treatments are very, very skewed to the right. This would be support for the hypothesis. Now, there's a couple of other ways we could have drawn the sketch. You know, we could have drawn the middle bar very tall and all the others low or all of them tall and one of them very low. You know, all of these would indicate some kind of non-random pattern of preference. But but this is this is a good example of, you know, what support for the hypothesis would look like. So this is the first part of show the data is to think about what what the data would look like. And now when we look at the actual data um, from this experiment, again, here was our no support, here was our support. The actual data looked like this, where they very closely matched that student sketch. And basically it was, it was almost no eggs in the three driest treatments here on the left, zero, um, 12 and a half, 25, these three right here. And, oh, sorry about that. Uh, one second. Let me, let me go back with my back arrows. There we are. Um, and uh, so very, very little, uh, very, very few samples in the lowest treatments. And then a uh, much greater number of samples. You can see over 20 here and roughly 35 here in the in the two uh, wettest substrates uh, available, the wettest choices. So this is, you know, this is strong support for the hypothesis and it looks pretty much, you know, how we expected strong support to look. Now in thinking about the, can, you know, the confidence in here, you got to consider your sample size. And I don't, I don't know exactly how many total eggs were in here, but, you know, roughly 35 in the, in the wettest, 20 here, 21 here. So let's say, you know, 56 over here and then down here total, this maybe looks like it's five or six or seven at the most uh, uh, in these drier treatments. So with a pretty big sample with, with categorical outcomes like this, this data seems pretty convincing. Um, you know, I would say I have a high degree of confidence that this hypothesis is supported the female lizards did in fact prefer the wetter environments for for egg laying so i'm i'm pretty strong confidence now we could do a statistical test to you know to say basically what is the probability of getting data like these at random you know due to random chance alone and that's what our p value does in a statistical test but i would say with data like these we almost don't need statistics we we can just say hey we i have a high degree of of confidence in uh this result here and then finally, our, our final step in this, in this workflow for working with data is deciding how we're going to communicate this evidence to our audience. And for me, it would, this particular case, this is thinking about, you know, what graph do we want to use for this? So I, I, you know, pulled up four different graphs that all show the same result. You see, you see the one, um, second from the left, which is the, the one we looked at. But all four of these actually, you know, show the same thing. And you can think about, you know, how do you want to convey this story to your, to your audience? What is the best choice? Um, and, and, you know, in this case, I, with, with such a clear result as this, I don't know that there's necessarily a wrong choice, but you can think about, you know, who is my audience for this? And I don't know, maybe you're presenting to, uh, you know, middle school students visiting your lab on a field trip. Well, you know, maybe they won't have ever seen a categorical bubble plot before. So maybe that's not, you know, the one you go with, or maybe you explicitly do want to walk them through a new graph type. And so you do choose that, or, you know, maybe you think the, the standard bar chart that we looked at, you know, or, or frequency plot, as I uh, more often call it, Maybe, maybe that's what we want to do because you think they'll be familiar with it and it'll communicate it the fastest. Um, all I'm saying is you should really think about this and don't leave it up to chance, but actually think about your choices of what type of graph or, or what colors you're using or spacing um, to communicate your result. I'm also a big fan of if you've got a main result, 
um, you know, like in this case, females prefer wetter environments to lay eggs, you know, go ahead and, and put that at the top of the slide and then put the graph that illustrates that. Don't, don't, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible on your audience. Don't force them to work their way through the graph. There's nothing wrong with showing them a clear graph and telling them exactly what the conclusion they should draw from it is. Um, if your goal is to communicate, uh, there, you, you can't do that too clearly, right? So um, that's just my take on that. Okay, so that's that's sort of an example. Um, I, uh, again, I'm gonna give you this choice of, of data sets that are in the Data Classroom um, resource library. So I want you for this week to independently analyze two of the following data sets. And I, I think this will probably take you uh, between 30 and 60 minutes um, to do. And um, I would ask that you try to get this done before we come back next session um, and be ready to talk about your data sets. Be ready to tell me what was the main question um, and you know what was your conclusion and how confident were you and show me some evidence uh, in the form of a, of a graph. Um, so again, these data sets are listed here, these these are um, six options for data sets. I ask that you go ahead and pick two. Um, they all have uh, loosely a public health theme, um, so they're all they're all kind of related to public health. Um, but go ahead and pick two. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one, and and it's not from this list. I'm gonna actually go through um, with that. Uh, Taylor Swift and Kansas City Chiefs performance data set that I used to demo uh, last week when we were in person. And I'm gonna go through that and model how I want you to go um, through these exercises. So I am going to, um, I guess I'm gonna stop screen share for one. Uh, nope, I'm just gonna switch uh, screen share. Give me one second here. I can. Oh no, I've done my screencastify in a way that is not going to let me uh, switch. So I'm going to send you this video in two parts. This part is the lecture slide, and then I'm going to uh, uh, send you the next part, which is walking you through the the uh, data set and modeling what I want you to do. So again, um, also, if you have any questions this week while you're working, um, you can reach me at Aaron at dataclassroom.com. Okay, well, I'll see you on the part two video.